Hey Magic Kimmy on YouTube, T1 Glistener Elf here. This is my Vintage Lutri Time Walks deck. So Lutri is one of the companions and usually is considered to be the worst or amongst the worst out of all of them. The obvious format for Lutri involves it being banned, Commander. So Lutri has this little restriction. Each non-land card in your starting deck has to have a different name. So each in your main board. That would be kind of busted in Commander, but you know, for obvious reasons, it's banned. Okay, so if that's the case, where else are we going to be able to run it? And the restriction of being able to only have one of each non-land card is pretty huge. It, because it means that you're not going to be able to run any four ofs of whatever card would be ideal for you to run. So Delver, you need to play Delver, right? Loam, you need to have Loam, etc. Uh, however, I'm running it in Vintage, and Vintage has a restricted list. Indeed, if you know nothing else about Vintage other than it has old and powerful cards, you know it has a restricted list. It's similar to the limited list in Yu-Gi-Oh, where you only get one of a given card per deck. So, because of that, it already builds in some resilient, some lack of opportunity cost to playing Lutri. Now, what are you gaining? You're gaining a card in your hand, effectively. And this card is a 3-2 with flash. Well, when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, so no blink shenanigans, it's not quite dual caster mage. A copy target instant or sorcery spell you control, you may choose new targets for the copy. Now we have some exceedingly powerful instants and sorceries, some of the strongest in the game, indeed the strongest in the game. And so we're going to be copying those, but then also a few <laughs> that aren't quite as strong. One way to try to get around Lutri is to have a lot of cards that are close to the same thing. If you think of, say, Modern Burn, you have Lightning Bolt, and then as many imitators of Lightning Bolt as you can have. Well, with, with Time Walks, you have actual factual Time Walk, and then as many imitators as you have, and we'll get to these. There are nine Time Walks in the deck, plus the effects that'll copy them, and, and there are a few of those. Uh, so that means that we're going to be running a Lutri in a deck that already doesn't have to deal quite as hard as, say, Legacy or Modern or Standard or Pioneer would with that restriction. Indeed, you may have even seen some people that try to run, say, like, four-color, mid-range, good stuff, because there's so many... they basically just run the restricted list as their deck. <laughs> well, we're not quite doing that, but we are, we are sticking to just one color, but we are playing some powerful cards. So, I mentioned it's Time Walks. This is Time Walk. Take an extra turn. It's a uh, target player takes an extra turn. And then we have as many imitators of that effect as possible. We have Capture of Jingzo, which is you get an extra turn. Time Warp, which is target player takes an extra turn. The, the targeting restriction matters for misdirection, but otherwise, usually not. And then we have Temporal Manipulation. These three are basically just five mana time walks. They're, they're pretty much strict. One is strictly worse time walk. <laughs> the others are pretty much. They're not susceptible to, to redirect effects, and that's about it. Okay, so then we have part the water veil for one extra mana, but really four extra mana. You get an extra turn and a win condition. You get a 6-6 six, six with haste. So if you happen to have 10 mana when this goes off, congrats on your attack, and you get an extra turn, so you get another attack. That seems pretty good. Uh, it's, it's slow, though, but we'll get there. We have Walk the Eons, which is six mana time walk, but you have the ability to buy it back by sacrificing three islands, which the deck can do. Then you have Nexus of Fate, which is seven mana, take an extra turn, but then it shuffles into your deck. It, you played against this in Standard. If you played Standard, you played against this in Standard. This card can be obnoxious, but it's a, when it's a one of, and we don't have ways to tutor it up, it's not so bad. It's not standard where your win con was to fairy Nexus of Fate. Thankfully, it's not that bad. Uh, then we have Temporal Manipula- or Mastery, excuse me. <laughs> this is, at best, slightly worse time walk. It exiles on resolution. At worst, it's seven mana Nexus of Fate that exiles on resolution. It doesn't go in your deck. So it, it's not great, but it gives you another time walk, potentially. Then Temporal Trespass, which costs 3 mana. It looks like 11, is actually 3. Don't worry, we filled the yard quickly enough for Delve. Even with the ones that do exile themselves on resolution, we're fine. 
pl you'll see the rest of the deck list, we're good. Now, that being the case, it should be noted, three of them exile on resolution. This is a, a mechanic that they gave the time walk spells, and others, to be fair, that are doing powerful effects, having powerful effects, to try to balance them at least a bit. Not that we care here, I suppose. Uh, and then we have Gitax. So on to card draw, we have Gitaxian Probe. Zero mana, one, but really zero mana. Uh, look at their hand, draw a card. You get to know whether it's safe to go off, potentially, and uh, you get to get an extra card. Filters through your deck, fills your yard, easy enough. Ancestral Recall, the best around. No one's ever going to get it. Okay, so <laughs> this is draw three cards for one mana. It's, it's busted, it's exactly as busted as it looks. Run it. And then we have Brainstorm. Uh, draw. It's almost Ancestral Recall. We have enough ways to shuffle that we can take those two cards that we put back, two cards we didn't really need, shuffle them away so we can start getting a fresh set. So, seems good. It's, it's often Ancestral Recall. Ponder is similar to that. We get one card, usually the best card off the top of our deck, and then we shuffle it with, say, a fetch land, for instance. Uh, and if, if that's not the case, we'll still be able to index three, we'll be able to stack the top three cards of our deck, and if none of them are good, we can shuffle and then draw a card. We can even use, say, like a brainstorm and then a ponder, and use the ponder just as the shuffle effect. Unless that third card is just really good, <laughs> that is another way that we can do it. So then we have preordain. Now this is not restricted, but we have Lutri, so we only get to run one, but don't worry, we have plenty of other broken card draw spells, like Dig Through Time. It's not technically card draw, but it's two mana. I know it looks like eight. It's two. At instant speed, you get to pick out of the top seven cards of your deck the two best and put them into your hand. This card is great. This card is sort of an oops I win, but not oops I win. This is like uh, back when you used to go, end of turn, fact or fiction, you lose in standard. Well, yeah. This! <laughs> this. You resolve it at the end of your opponent's turn, get your two best cards, draw a card, and you're probably so far ahead, you're probably winning this game. Okay, so then we have Frantic Search. Now this one is banned in Legacy. It's not actually restricted in Vintage, but this is a really powerful effect. So it's actually a card disadvantage. For three mana, you draw two, discard two, so you're down a card but you get to untap up to three lands, which means the card is effectively free. Now, when you're going off later on, and you've just gotten to the point where you're drawing a lot of extra lands, for instance, dead cards, this will let you convert those effectively into, hopefully, cards that you can actually use, and you still get to keep your mana. Plus, there are cards that will reduce the cost of these spells so that you actually net mana. We have several of those in the deck. Off the top of my head, I think it's three. Yep, so it's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, so then, let's see. Scroll through for a bit. All right. And then we have a Merchant Scroll to go and get us often Ancestral Recall just to draw a ton of cards, or Dig Through Time so that we can select the cards that we get, or a Counterspell like Force of Will so that we can protect ourselves as we're ready to start going off. So Merchant Scroll is a little bit of whatever you need. Now it only gets blue Instance. Now, blue is the deck outside of artifacts and lands, uh, but instance, which means we actually can't get any of our time walk spells. But we can get cards like Ancestral Recall, so it's it's still okay. <laughs> it's still worth it. Uh, then we have Sensei's Divining Top. Now, this one is absolutely astounding. I would run more if I could. It lets us sort the top of our deck, which matters for, again, like miracles um, and just making sure that we hit lands early on, hit time walks as, or yeah, time walk effects as we go off, and then if we need to, we can shuffle. It gives us an extra draw, so if we're balancing a force of will on top of our deck, we can trade it for that, etc. It's it's a it's a pretty good card. You may have seen, you may have heard. It's banned in modern and legacy for a reason, for a couple of reasons actually. Then we have search for Ezcanta. This will help us to fill the yard sort through our deck, make sure that we get what we need early on especially, and then in the late game this turns into a land that goes and gets, it's basically four mana, look at the top four, get a non-creature, non-land, add it to your hand. So this is often, once you had just have a ton of mana, this is you get to go off every turn. It's pretty good. Then we have Mana Drain, which is not actually uh, restricted in Vintage. Mana Drain, at least not as of when I'm recording this, uh, you counter spell and then you get its mana cost in your main phase as colorless mana. 
which lets you start going off pretty early. So if ever there's a deck in Vintage that can really use Mana Drain, it's this. Then we have Force of Will, because of course we do. Now we only get one, but remember that Loot Tree's restriction only applies to the main board, so you can imagine that's where the others are. And then we have Force of Negation, because we only get one Force of Will, and it's not strictly worse, it's okay. It does different stuff. Mental Misstep, because we need to protect our cantrips and stop our opponents from using theirs. Uh, we also have, now we're starting to get into actual win conditions, we have Jace the Mind Sculptor, one of the most powerful planeswalkers in the game. If you, it, it does have an immediate effect once you cast it, once you resolve it. Even if it doesn't make it till the next turn, at the very least you got to unsummon or get a brainstorm in and maybe fog a little bit of damage. But if you get to untap with Jace the Mind Sculptor, that's almost certainly game. You get to brainstorm every turn, so you get to go up on card advantage and you just get to go time walk into time walk into time walk. Uh, if you have a ton in your hand already, you can immediately start fate sealing, but otherwise, Jace brainstorm every turn into another win condition, like one of the others below it, or even just brainstorm into eventually you can start fate sealing. I've done that before too. Jace is pretty good, and none of these legendary cards have any opportunity cost except one in the deck because, again, they're all one ofs. So it's fine to run Jace. Uh, speaking of powerful blue planeswalkers, we have Narset Parter of Veils. Now, she's not strictly speaking a win condition. She doesn't actually win you the game. She prevents the opponent from being able to draw extra cards, which is already exceedingly powerful. Uh, but she also will go and get two, usually, two cards for you. So look at the top four, get a non-creature, non-land, reveal it, put it in your hand. Easy enough. Uh, and that means often time walks. So she'll give you two time walks in, in plenty of cases, and if not, usually something else that's exceedingly powerful. Another draw spell, for instance. Uh, and then we have Baral. Not an actual win con. The looting is nice, but we don't have that many counter spells. Really what you're using it for is it's a bit of a body, which matters in some matchups, uh, but it's also going to reduce the cost of our instants and sorceries by one. So we can play Baral early and start going off with time walks sooner. We have God Eternal Kefnet. Now, here's a win con. If ever there's a card in the deck that we could run more than one of, <laughs> uh, it might very well be God Eternal Kefnet. It's kind of everything that we need, kind of. So we're talking a four mana creature that flies. It's a four five, so it's gonna be a win con, duh. But then beyond that, you reveal the first card of each turn that you draw. It doesn't matter if it's your turn or an opponent's turn, you reveal that card uh, or you look at it, and then if it happens to be an instant or sorcery, you can reveal it, and you get to cast a copy. It's a copy, not the actual card. The actual card's going in your hand, and that copy costs two less. So, for example, I find uh, Time Warp. I get a three mana copy of that Time Warp, and then on the next turn, I can cast actual Time Warp, or maybe I found another one on the top of the deck, and I'll cast that copy instead, and this just keeps going and going. Uh, we do have ways, again, like top, for instance, to balance the top of our deck. We have Brainstorm, we have Jace. We can try to set the top card of our deck, and if we do, we're in business. We're in good shape. Okay. Uh, and then we have other things like Sensei's Divining Top, like Jace Friend's Prodigy, to try to get an activation, a trigger rather, on our opponent's turn, because this works even with sorcery speed spells, so sorceries, on our opponent's turn. Seems pretty nice. All right. So then Jace Friend's Prodigy. So early in the game, this will be filtering, making sure we get the cards we need and filling the yard for cards like Dig Through Time and Temporal Trespass and Search for Escanta. Later on, this is a win condition. It has a baby fog effect, but that's not what we care about. You can use it as a win mill con, uh, win con, uh, mill win con, there we go, using its emblem, or you can use it to get extra, active, er, extra cast of your time walk spells to keep going off. A lot of our win conditions you'll see will be win cons on their own and or they help to support some of the others in the deck. Uh, Snapcaster Mage. Even at a 2-1, it's still absolutely worth it. We get an extra time walk, and with enough turns, even a 2-1 will get the job done. And if nothing else, it's a decent body, and it has flash, and it also could just give us three extra cards, because Ancestral Recall is a card. Uh, next we have Lutri. Now remember, the companion restriction only applies to the main board, so the fact that there's one in the sideboard doesn't preclude me from being able to run one in the main board, so we do. It's still a powerful enough effect. 
Now, we have, here's another win con that I've been toying around with. Feel free to think that this is silly, because it kind of is, but it, if you want to think of it as being something like a bigger, beefier version of, say, like a Sahili or Young Pyromancer, except we're not making 1-1s, one we're making 5-5s five with this. So, when you cast an instant or sorcery, you get an XX colorless construct artifact creature token, where X is that spell's CMC. Which means, not only do we get, say, a 5-5 five five off of Time Warp, but we get an extra turn, so we're going to be attacking with that 5-5 five five in just a bit. And if we can keep doing this, this very quickly becomes a win con. However, it has another little effect. If we need to, we can, after we have enough artifacts, this rarely will come up, to be fair, but you can sacrifice it, or rather, I should say, you exile it, and you get all the instants of sorceries back from your yard to your hand. And remember, only three of them, only three of our time walks, exile on resolution. The rest come, the rest just go in the yard, so they will come back, in addition to the rest of our effects. I keep harping on Ancestral Recall because it's good. That's one of them. So then we have Tinker, Blightsteel. So many artifacts in the deck we haven't seen yet, but Tinker, uh, when you cast it, sack an artifact, you get another artifact from your deck and put it on the field. It's probably going to be Blightsteel Colossus. This is a Billy Mays commercial, but Phyrexian. This is an 11-11 Trample, Infect, Indestructible, but wait, there's more! It shuffles back in if it goes in the yard, but <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty decent. Uh, so then we get to the mana in the deck, and uh, lots of artifacts. We have good old Black Lotus, because vintage. Uh, we have the full set of Moxen, Emerald, Jet, Pearl, Ruby, Sapphire. We have Soul Ring. Uh, we have Sapphire Medallion, so your blue spells, all your blue spells, cost one less to play. That includes your creatures like Loot Tree. We have Telerian Academy, which, again, lots of artifacts, so this will get you above curve. If you can get a Telerian Academy, then instead of having to wait till turn, you know, three or four or five to go off, you can do it much, much sooner. And by go off, I mean you have a win con, and additionally you have, like, time walks. You can start time walking. So this will let you do it two or, turn two or three, depending on what all you draw. Fair enough. So then we have plenty of fetch lands. Flooded Strand, Misty Rainforest, Polluted Delta, Prismatic Vista, and Scalding Tarn. That is ten fetch lands to help fill the yard for us. They're all functionally the same thing. They get an island, and they cost one life. We have this variety because sometimes you need to for something like Sorcerer, Spyglass, or Pithing Needle. But really, it's it doesn't have to be that configuration. Just use whatever. Uh, seven snow-colored islands. Snow because we might be able to get our opponent to think we're running some snow shenanigans. At the very least, like an Arkham's Astrolabe. And then a uh, Library of Alexandria. Because if you're on the draw, you get to use this as your one land. Now you still have seven cards in hand, and you can tap it to draw a card. And when you're playing a control mirror, which is a lot of vintage, then you get to have so many more cards that you can drown your opponent in card advantage. And, you know, for your turn, draw a card. Uh, eventually, when you're doing some time walk shenanigans, uh, draw a card, Library of Alexandria activation, draw a card, play a time walk, and there you go. <laughs> you get to keep doing that turn after turn. It gives you extra shots at finding time walks. Okay, so now remember the loot tree restriction doesn't apply to the sideboard. You saw the main, it looks like 14 cards in the sideboard. It's 15 loot trees just starting in play. Not in play, actually. I'm just revealing it to the opponent right off. Uh, and then we'll put it in the sideboard, as you do. So then we have three Force of Will, and I use a different art just to distinguish main board or sideboard. Uh, we have one, oh, okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. We'll do this by archetype. So, Force of Will comes in whenever we need Force of Will. Whenever we're playing against combo decks, for instance. Uh, Graf Digger's Cage comes in against Oath and Dredge, because in the case of Oath, it prevents the creature from entering from the library. In the case of Dredge, it prevents them from entering from the graveyard. Narcomoeba, Icarid, Bloodgas, Prized Amalgam, everything in the deck but Hollow One, and of course that includes the Dread Return targets. So, Hollow One, Gurmog Angler, or Bust is pretty much how that goes. Uh, however, they can still use Hollow One, so we run one copy of City in a Bottle. The only opportunity cost here is that it hits our own Library of Alexandria. We'll live. We'll be fine. Uh, but the fact that it can actually keep them from having Bazaar of Baghdad in play means that not even Hollow One is safe, because they're never going to get it out to start the draw two, discard three. So City in a Bottle is really, really strong, but it doesn't have the utility that Graf Digger's Cage has, hence it being a one-of. Now we have first shops. 
Uh, three, oh, and by the way, you can also bring in Strip Mine for Dredge because it gives you, it hopefully will give them just one activation of Bazaar of Baghdad. You'll Strip Mine it after the first. Uh, for shops, we have Energy Flux as a three of. This is all artifacts, including yours though, to be fair. At the be they gain at the beginning of your upkeep, sack this artifact unless you pay two. That is backbreaking for any shops list. How they get around that is they beat you before you can cast it, or they might get one extra turn after it resolves. They might get a turn to go off from there. The, you run a lot of artifacts, but they need them, you don't. So eventually you'll be okay. Uh, that's usually how that works out. We also have one Hercules Recall because in addition to being an instant speed way to deal with their shenanigans, you can find it with Merchant Scroll. It is indeed a blue instant after all. Uh, so it gives you something you can tutor up for Artifact A. Uh, you can bring in Strip Mine. I recommend it. You have enough dead cards, you can do so. Uh, but also there's Damping Sphere, which comes in on the play against shops. If you have the ability to cast it before your opponent can start going off with Mishra's Workshop and Ancient Tomb and Moxen Spam, then absolutely. But you also always bring it in against Storm Decks, and there are definitely Storm Decks now. <laughs> so, and, and that includes Paradoxal Out... Paradoxical Outcome, Lurus Storm, anything that's trying to run Bolas' Citadel, you get the idea. You bring it in against those kinds of decks. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's Lutri. <laughs> that is Vintage Lutri Time Walks. This number right here, 1111111111111111, one, 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 all the way down, for almost all the way down, until we get to the lands. If you have any suggestions for the deck, then absolutely please feel free to let me know. Let me give you some, some ideas that I had. I think that there might be some room for thirst for knowledge in the deck somewhere. It's a three mana instant. It lets you go. Here, let me let me pull the card up actually real quick. <laughs> Sorry, Glistener Elf, I gotta let you go. Thirst for actually I can probably just get it off of Thirst for. Nope, nope, I can't. Thirst for no? Hey, there we go. There we go. Alright, so for the people who haven't played the format enough to see, Thirst for No, no, it's not a Mox Ruby. There we go. Let's you, at instant speed for three mana, draw three cards, and in the context of a deck like this, it's usually draw three, discard one, because you only have to discard one if you discard an artifact. So it's a plus one. At worst, it's a plus zero, so it just filters you through the deck a little bit. It, it seems like there might be some room somewhere in there. Additionally, some other cheap actual win cons would be nice. So, for example, the three mana Mu, uh, Young Ling, I believe. The... Uh, Planeswalker, who's like a Moonfolk, I believe, or maybe even Tamio, would be pretty good to have. No, she's not a Moonfolk. Tamio's the Moonfolk. That's right. Moo is not. Whatever. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So that would be that would be nice. But she's kind of slow. She doesn't really have an impact on the board, especially against uh, immediate impact, I should say. Especially against decks that don't have creatures. You don't get a four-four until the turn after she's come into play. Which, to be fair, you can then start using as a potential win con, and the emblem is excellent. You, all your islands gain tap draw a card. At that point, you can't not find a time lock, but she seems kind of slow, hence her exclusion here. There might also be room for Gush. Gush is very, very powerful. Shouts to Stephen Menendian. I mention him every time, but he actually wrote the book on Gush. It's called Understanding Gush. Go check it out. And... It, it seems wrong to not have Gush in here somewhere, but this is a big mana deck. This can't really operate off of too little mana, and so that's why it's not in here. It could very well be, perhaps even it should be, but I don't have it in right now, and I need to find room for it, probably. <laughs> now, in all, in all seriousness, you could actually not even alternate cast it. Eventually, you can get to the point where it is an instant, you can cast it for five mana, but more likely you use it as a, something of a ramp spell. You put two cards back in your hand, two islands, after tapping them, then draw two cards, then put one of them in again. The problem is that we need more ramp than just that. It needs to be more permanent ramp so that we can keep casting time walk spells over and over. It'd be nice to be able to find some room in the deck for Karn, uh, the great creator, to be able to shut down opposing artifact decks, paradoxical outcome, it's a little bit late for most uh, shops decks these days, but that would be nice. And it gives me another win condition, both by turning some of my other artifacts into actual win cons, but giving me 
using up a sideboard slot for, say, Mycosynth Lattice or letting me have slots where I can go and get Damping Sphere or Chalice of the Void or something like that from the sideboard, though to be fair, that one card in the main board would take quite a few slots out of the sideboard. So it's kind of hard to justify bringing in Karn in a deck that doesn't really need him. Uh, and that's it. That's Lutri Time Walks. Again, if you have any suggestions, any other cards you'd recommend, let me know and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. And thank you very much for, uh, for watching this. Take care, Magic Community, and I will see you later. Bye-bye!